morning, everyone. Thanks for coming. This is our subject for this morning, and we are with... Um, Oh, hey, I'm Paul Luce from, <laughs> from Intel. I'm a software engineer from Intel. Um, I uh, have not been contributing to Storlets. I'm uh, one of the Swift core developers, but I think Storlets are way freaking cool. Um, so I'm up here to give you a, a couple of slides on Swift to make sure we're all level set there. Let's make sure it works. Hey, uh, I'm Hamdi Romani from IBM. I wanted to really thank you all for coming out. I know it's kind of uh, early today after the HP event yesterday, but uh, I'm also from IBM, and I've been working on Storlets for maybe three or four months and doing Swift for a little bit longer. And like Paul said, I think they're, uh, they're a really neat thing. So I hope you guys enjoy. And I'm Aran, I'm also from IBM. Um, <coughs> I'm the IBM technical lead for this stuff. And I really like it, so I hope you'll like it too. So let's get started. So this is the, like the usual agenda. We'll talk about the concept, the motivating use cases, then Paul would give the Swift overview, and then Hamdi would give the Storlets overview, <coughs> and the Storlet um, OpenStack project. Yes, we have. We have it as an OpenStack project now, and now I'll end up with a vision. All right, so the concept. Imagine you have a storage system that can hold petabytes of storage, many petabytes of storage. And the system is being used as a service. So what would people put there? Their photos. Um, they might put their IoT data, archived IoT data in the format of CSV files. They might put their 3D designs. This is a bit futuristic. Um, think about the 3D printing era. I'll talk about it later. And they might put their like digital media files, huge files usually. Now, what happens if one wishes to do some computation over that data without moving it around for various reasons that I'll show next? So the concept here is to collocate compute in the storage system. And the reason that I'm drawing here a Docker container as the compute engine is because we're not talking about any computation. We're talking about computations that are uploaded by the users. So we want them to be well isolated. So I could have drawn here like KVM or anything else, but since we're working with Docker, there's the Docker logo there. So why would we want that? Let's assume that the user put his photos um, in the storage system. Now, we know that photos have embedded metadata called EXIF metadata in JPEGs. And that EXIF metadata is quite rich. You can get there all the camera settings, where it was photoed, and so on and so forth. This means that the user would probably want to ask something like, how many pictures were taken in Tokyo between those dates, where the ISO that was used was 400, right? valid question, he would probably want to use his favorite analytics engine, Spark. Here's the problem. The problem is that Sparks know how to, how to process semi-structured data, whereas the metadata is saved, is embedded in binary files, which are the JPEGs, right? So there's a problem here. So I call this use case data preparation, where we can use compute on the storage to extract the EXIF metadata from the pictures before we um, before we do the, um, instead of actually downloading the pictures to the Swift cluster, sorry, to the Spark cluster, so that the Spark only gets the EXIF metadata. So we save on bandwidth, we save on memory in the Spark, uh, in the Spark cluster, and of course we actually make this use case of work. Otherwise we couldn't do that. So this use case was explored by, uh, was um, Michael Factor and Gil Vernick from IBM gave a talk in the um, Paris Swift Tech Summit about this. Here is the link, um, the data preparation use case. Uh, I'll move to the next use case, which I call it predicate pushdown. So suppose that we had all this information about the picture taken in a CSV file rather than in the um, JPEGs. So we have a huge table there, and we want to make the same query, right? So let's zoom in into the CSV files. It's a huge table containing Lots of rows, one for each picture, and for each picker, picture we have all the EXIF metadata, like the location, the f-top, the ISO, focal length, and so on and so forth. For our query, we're not really interested in, in all the data, right? We're interested only in the location column, the ISO column, and the date, according to the query. Moreover, we only want the line coming from Paris. So, um, Sorry, that's the only, <laughs> I see question mark on the faces. So the Paris line is the only one that matches the, um, the query here, okay? <laughs> um, so why not push this filtering 
to the storage, right? So we don't need to download all the CSV to the Spark cluster again. We can just use Stolets or to use the compute, I didn't say Stolet yet, to, to use the compute near the storage to actually do the filtering inside the storage system. So this is predicate pushdown. Um, we have seen significant reduction in the overall time taken to process a query. I should, uh, I mean, from, from, from end to end, like from the Spark point of view, although I should say these are very initial results. Um, but it's promising. Um, I did want to mention one more thing about his use case. So on the Tuesday talk, we were talking about another kind of push down, which was used by metadata search. So what have we done with metadata search? With metadata search, we've shown the capability to narrow down the list of objects that we're interested in using metadata search. So we have a bunch of objects in the object store that we want to process, right? However, our query is such that only small part of them are of, are of interest. So we can do use metadata search to narrow down to that um, small group of objects and on them do this stuff, right? So these are like complementary solutions. Right, let's talk about data security. Um, and this brings me to the 3D printing era. So it is said that in the 3D printing era, the ability to manufacture becomes commodity. So people are not longer going to pay for the ability of one to manufacture something, but rather more on the design. By the way, the right hand side, on the right hand side, th there's an illustration of a concrete based 3D printer. Um, they have it working. They're like nice new YouTube um, showing that. Anyway, so assuming people would still use object stores in this era, people would probably put their 3D designs in the object store. Um, they would probably never want them, sorry, that was too early. They would probably never want those designs to leave the object store. However, they would be very happy to sell a printed version of this design. What do I mean by that? Usually, when you want to print something, some 3D model, you need to do some lossy transformation that allows it to be printed. And that lossy transformation is dependent on the actual printer you're using, right? So again, using Stolets, one can <coughs> download a transformed version of the 3D design that fits his desktop or her desktop um, printer. Uh, but we don't really need to wait for the 3D printing era. Think about this one, where you have like medical records inside your storage system, and you want to make it available to researchers, but since this is medical records, you probably want to de-identify them before you give them to anyone else, right? So the personal information is being erased there. Um, so this use case was um, further explored by the Forget IT EU project. They have done their face blurring. So in the storage system, there was the actual picture, and once downloaded, the faces were blurred. I hope you can see this in the picture. So there's a link to uh, YouTube sh uh, that shows this demo. It's quite nice. Um, I'll skip about this one really, really fast. So this one we've talked about in, um, in the OpenStack Paris Summit. It has to do with uh, digital um, films. So the RAI, the Radio Television Italy national broadcaster was using Stolets to actually employ <coughs> algorithms once the object was already in the stores. So think about it this way. These are large files, very large files. So suppose you've already put them in the storage, and after putting them, you came up with a new algorithm to extract feature for them. For example, the loudness of the film. So instead of downloading, downloading the object, calculating it, and then uploading it again or whatever, you can just do this in place with compute on storage. Last use case, inspired by a comment that was gave by Paul at the time. So <clears throat> I call it the super user use case. So in recent years, we're seeing more and more storage systems that are not appliances. Rather, they are software, commodity hardware, and there's an operator there that does the installation of the software on the hardware, operates the hardware, and sell it as a service, right? So if he could use compute on storage, he could add more value or generic functionality to the storage system using this compute, right? It, did, it doesn't need to wait for the um, 
for the software developers to do that for him. He can just add this alone. So examples are like antivirus, um, compression, encryption, and so on and so forth. Like generic um, storage stuff that you can just add to the system. Perhaps Paul will show next how easy it can be done with uh, Swift. Oh, um, this idea was taken further by a project called IOStack. That's a European project that, by the way, I find in Matripure. Uh, <laughs> what they do is that they have added a policy layer on top that says something like, all right, every time there is a request for a certain, for, from a user belonging to a certain account or a certain tenant, do a compression on it or encrypt it. So it's kind of an automating layer to use those computations. Um, so with that, I'm, oh, sure, that's most importantly. So all this stuff is now available as an open stack project um, in GitHub. Um, Hamdi will talk about it, and of course, any help is mostly welcome. So I'll hand the mic to um, Paul. The other mic. Yeah, the other mic. You can hear me the clicker. <laughs> Use use that. Oh, excellent. All right, so that was awesome, awesome. I'd love to see these use cases. They really do a great job of identifying the motivation for the work these guys have done. It's so much more effective, I think, to see real use cases, especially a variety of them, as opposed to saying, what if, and painting some hypothetical stuff. This is all really cool stuff. It's got a lot of us really excited about it. So before Hamdi gets into the details of Starlets, I wanted to make sure we were all sort of level set on some very basics of Swift. I know there's a lot of Swift people in the audience. Um, but um, if you don't have the, the basics, it's hard to understand how all this stuff bolts together and really where things are making connections. OK, so a couple things about the Swift community. Uh, as probably most folks know, uh, we're one of the first uh, two projects uh, in OpenStack. We're up to somewhere around. Um, 40,000 lines of functional code and another 80,000 lines of test code. So we're somewhere generally between 2 to 1 and 3 to 1 on um, functional versus test code, um, which is pretty good. Um, we've got just a fantastic community. I see there's a lot of core folks in here. We all love to come to each other's talks and support us, so, <laughs> so thanks for coming. Um, but uh, John, our PTL, in one of our sessions yesterday gave some really cool graphs showing um, the increase in the number of contributors in the Swift community and how often they come back and, and how long they've stuck with the program. And it really tells just a fantastic story of if you're a developer, what a great community this is to work in. Um, so besides the, the long list of company names here, I did collect a few um, stats from the last three summits and you can see the number of presentations in the main conference, not the design summit, just with Swift in their title, right? And I didn't count it twice when they used Swift twice in the title. Uh, <laughs> Uh, in Paris, we had 14, um, and then Vancouver, 19, and then up over 20 here in Tokyo. So we just continue to see more and more interest and more people voting to hear more about Swift. Um, so it's just a really exciting program to work on, um, a fantastic community to work in. I uh, won't go through all the timeline below. Um, just to be clear, these are things of sort of focus areas for these releases. They're not actual features in the release. For, so for example, we're not releasing encryption um, right now, but this is a big focus area for us here at this design summit. Lots of um, discussions on the encryption work that's going on. Okay, so a couple of high-level bullets on Swift, just so you get a picture of what it is. Um, obviously, it's an object storage system. Um, we use a container model, very much like S3 buckets, to group things together for like characteristics. Um, easiest one to grasp, of course, is ACLs, right, securities. Um, also, storage policies is a big one. If you've been following Swift, that's a um, uh, year before last, a uh, big feature that we added. Uh, everything is through RESTful interface, right, stateless RESTful interface. So very easy to use, um, very uh, strong API. Uh, lots of other storage systems have layers built on top so they can actually support Swift. So we've sort of uh, become a de facto standard in that area. Um, and then, of course, built on standard hardware um, and highly scalable and efficient. So uh, you don't have to go with any specific vendor lock-in to go out and buy something and build yourself a Swift cluster. Pretty much you can build it with, with anything you've got, right? Stitch it together and make it work. And eventually consistent. Um, if you've been in any Swift talks, you understand the value of eventual consistency and um, it's funny, when you talk to people for the first time and they haven't heard of this, they think maybe it's a bug. <laughs> it's not a bug. It's designed to be that way, and there's uh, really good reasons for it. Um, if anybody wants to talk more about that afterwards, 
uh, there's plenty of us here that can explain that to you. So before, uh, before Hamdi gets into Storlets, I wanted to do uh, a high-level uh, architectural overview of sort of the main modules within Swift um, based on how they're tiered. And this is important so you can see where Storlets bolts in. Okay, so on the top, um, the top box here, this is the proxy tier. So if you're familiar with Swift, it's a two-tier architecture. Um, the proxy tier is where we scale for concurrency. So we can scale in two directions. If you need additional concurrency, you add more proxy services. If you need additional capacity, you add more storage services. You don't have to scale them at the same time. Um, the main blocks on the top um, is our, our whiskey server, our proxy application, and then uh, the one that's highlighted there, which is important for this talk, is middleware. Right? So extremely cool extensibility feature within Swift. Um, there's been lots of talks over the last couple of summits. Christian had a great one in, in Paris, was it? Or Hong Kong? I don't know where it was. <laughs> but fantastic talk. We wrote middleware from the, from the ground up right, right um, during the session and, and, uh, and showed it. So it really shows the power of, of middleware. Um, and what Storlitz does for middleware, uh, if you haven't already seen one of these talks, it'll blow your mind. It's so freaking cool. Um, but, but that middleware um, capability exists in the proxy tier, and, and if you look down on the bottom, it also exists in our storage tier, in our capacity tier. So the, the high-level software architecture is the same. We've got a whiskey server down there, we've got the middleware, um, the middleware framework, and then we've got multiple different proxy applications, or multiple different applications, I should say, that run on the storage node um, to handle all the various Swift stuff. Um, and we've got more detailed slides on this stuff, too, and if anybody wants to get into you know, more of the guts of Swift, I don't want to take up any more of the Storlitz time to do this, um, but we can certainly do that because it's, it's some really cool stuff. But that's the key point here is the, the middleware capability is where Storlitz bolts in. And then just to give you a, a visual um, of, you know, sort of what, what it looks like to put an object into Swift and what it looks like to put an object out of Swift, and then after you see the Storlitz stuff, you'll see how that intercepts things and, and does its magic. When we put an object into Swift, it comes in through our load balancer in our access tier where load balancer, auth services, and proxy is at. So that's where that little object is flying in. Um, it's going to get routed. In this case, we're using um, replication. I actually should have put the EC one in here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and shameless plug, there's a talk on EC, like four rows down right after this. So come down and hear about the progress on that stuff. Um, but um, there we are, shuffling this thing into three locations within the storage node. And then on the get side, we actually only get it from one place. Um, there's actually, it's configurable how we do the get, but, but you can see it comes in, hits its three nodes, and on its way back out, um, gets a one node. So that's the, uh, that's the general Swift overview. I'm gonna let Omdi take it Thanks over so for much, Paul. Uh, I want to start by saying I feel bad we didn't include Swift in the title of this presentation, because that would have been a plus one for you, I think, in terms of your account. <laughs> so I apologize. Go change the slide, make it 25. Mm -hmm. I'll go edit the title after. So just to start, I mean, Aaron gave a really good overview, and so did Paul, about what Storlets are and what Swift is. And I'm going to give a kind of a more in-depth, detailed explanation of exactly how Storlets fit into the Swift architecture. So what exactly is a Storlet? Well, it's pretty simple. Storlets are compiled Java code. Now, I want to start by saying Java code is currently what we support, but it's something that we're looking to actually extend in the future to other programming languages, maybe Python, but I thought I would just throw that out there. So storelets reside as middleware, and the really great thing about that is it essentially implies it required zero changes at all to core Swift. We needed no changes, we didn't touch any of the core Swift code whatsoever. I really want to point that out, because um, it's a lot of complex algorithms, but it all resides through middleware, which implies it's completely transparent to your Swift object storage, and you can plug it in extremely easily. So more specifically, how do storelets work? So storelets utilize Docker, and Docker may potentially reside on the same server or a different s server where your proxy or object server are. And that's what's gonna drive the compute engine. So as a really kind of high level overview, what could happen is you'll start by uploading the storelet. And all the storelet is is code. And it's gonna simply be an actual object sitting in Swift directly. Then you can actually inform Swift through, as you'll see later, a header, that you wanna execute the storelet on a specific object. We then kind of do all the magic of taking the input stream and output stream, wiring them together, and then letting that Java code execute on the Swift object. So it's actually really nifty. Um, the reason why we use Docker is it really does, I mean, like Aaron mentioned, provide a lot of good security and multi-tenancy as well. So we essentially have a Docker engine per Swift account. And that kind of provides the isolation and multi-tenancy that we have across the system. 
So Paul went into a really good overview of what middleware is. And what this slide is really pointing out is that's really all storelets are. They essentially reside as middleware. And the interesting thing about it is that they can actually live either on the proxy side or the object side. So what that means is you can in intercept data coming in at the proxy layer or even potentially at the object server layer, which is all the next slide actually shows. So how can you actually upload this compute to Swift? Well, it's, it's pretty straightforward. I was trying to think of an example. Aaron had a bunch of good ones, but I was trying to think of a silly one on the way uh, in today. And I was thinking, okay, let's say you use Swift as your code repository system. Maybe that's silly, it probably is. And let's say you store Python code in there. Uh, and let's say you, you really love Pepe. I mean, a lot of folks don't. So you want to Pepify stuff on the way in. So what would you do? So you found kind of a nifty Pep8 library lying around somewhere in the ecosystem. First step is you write a simple Java program. I know it's silly, you're using Java to Pepify Python code, but I can think of anything else. And you, you take this library, you write the Java code, hopefully you test it, you compile it, you get it reviewed. And then the very next step is essentially you create a package, a jar file for, for the Java code. And then you can take this dependency as kind of a, a separate thing, and you upload both to the Swift, to the Swift object storage system. Um, and there's a container you can put that in. There's a default one called the Storelets container, but you can create your own and modify all that. We actually have a lot of nifty tools that will actually allow you to, to do all this, to automate the entire process. All you have to supply is a jar file, and we'll upload it automatically to the Swift system. Another really interesting thing is that as we mentioned earlier, storelets actually execute in a Docker container and an image. And you can actually adjust that Docker container to have any dependencies that you need. So in this example, it's just one simple Java package, a Java library that does a PEP8 code. But for example, say you wanted to pull in a lot of other package, your better bet is actually to modify that Docker image that we'll use to run your storelet code. So here, we just kind of go through the exact steps of the put data flow in terms of executing storelets. And the really key thing to note is really all you really need to use is this new header, x run storelet. And x run storelet essentially says, for this object, I want to execute this particular storelet. The storelet will reside in a different container and a different account, and this will just say, this is the exact code, the compute, per se, you want to run on this specific object. It's exactly like uploading any other Swift object, really. So this kind of just goes through all the steps. And really, the key thing I want to point out is really all we do in the put flow is we take the input stream, which is what the user is supplying as data, wire that to the input of the actual storelet, the, the Java code in this case, and the output stream is actually going to go to the object server, and it's going to end up being written to disk. So just kind of a, a, a silly example. If your storelet did no nothing at all, it just maybe printed some logs and actually didn't do any compute whatsoever, the result of running that storelet will be as if you had no storelets at all. It's, it, there's absolutely going to be an, no changes done to the act, actual object you uploaded to store storage. So this kind of goes over the get data flow. And the one thing you should notice is it's essentially exactly the same. The only difference here is the input stream is going to obviously be the incoming object um, from the object server, whereas the output stream is going to go back to the client. So in this slide over here, we kind of go over the more detailed storelet architecture. I'm not going to spend too much time on it, but if anyone's interested, feel free to talk to me after and we can get into more details. But the one thing I want to point out is essentially we have a Docker container per Swift account. And that's how we do the multi-tenancy aspect and the security aspect. And as you can imagine, we need to have some kind of communication mechanism between the two. The two being the Swift system and then Docker residing on a potentially different system. And this is kind of the way we actually enable that. So we have the storelet's middleware itself. And then we have these buses and then just domain sockets that we use to be able to send commands and messages and the data itself, uh, the input stream, the file descriptors, which is what we end up using, between the Swift, potentially proxy or object server, and wherever your Docker container resides. So how do you actually write a storelet? So I just wanted to show a really simple example to show it's actually very straightforward. If you look at the actual interface to this function, this Java function, it's really simple. And what you can imagine is, there's an input stream and an output stream, and then parameters. And parameters in this case are simply the, the query string that you, that you supplied, for example, if you were doing a put or a get, they'll be actually supplied to your storelet as well. So you can communicate data as well to the storelet. And the actual code, sorry, it's a little bit messy, but the only thing I'm trying to show here is that 
really all you have to do is kind of what you would do is, is if you were doing anything else in um, Swift, which is the very first step is you get all the metadata and then you set that into the output stream. So you're essentially flowing back the HTTP headers. After that, you're free to play with the input and output stream as you wish. And this is where all your compute resides. So really all kind of the fun and magic of Storlets lives in this space here, regardless of what you were doing. So really writing Storlets couldn't really be any more simple than that. So yeah, I mean, sure. Any, anyone here can see that that was an array on, on Rails. So is yep. it ever going to have more than one entry? Uh, no, it, this is, it, it was made extensible for things we could change in the future. For example, if we had multiple input streams, but the way it works now is simply on one object. But it's a really good question because that's an idea that's came to us in the past, which is, is there any way we can actually work on multiple objects as opposed to just one? That's a little bit more difficult to do because as you can imagine, when you're working with Swift itself, generally speaking, there is a specific object you're always dealing with in the system, whether it be a get or a put. So, but very good point. And if you'd like to work on that, <laughs> we'd love you to. I have to figure out what that means first. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so. For example, say you actually want to start helping with the Storelet project, what exactly can you do? It's actually really, really simple. So the very first step is you can get a Ubuntu, Ubuntu image, and we're gonna probably expand this in the future to be compatible with other operating systems. And in terms of, yes. <laughs> and in terms of actually the install process, really all you need is a pseudo list, a passwordless account that you can end up using. Clone the code from the GitHub account, which is, yes, an OpenStack project now. And we have a nice script, uh, S2AIO, which it'll actually set up everything for you. This is Swift, and the Storlets ecosystem. So it's kind of an Ansible script that'll put everything together and install Storlets. But I can imagine many of you already have Swift systems out there. And in that case, and you still wanna play around with Storlets, it's actually still just as easy. And there's essentially an Ansible script you can run. There's a configuration file that'll point to where your proxy resides, where your object server resides, and a bunch of other details like that. And you can use that to essentially allow the script to configure Storlets and install it on your system. So this is actually my favorite slide, and I know we've mentioned this many times, but yes, Storlets is now an official OpenStack project. For us, that's actually really great, because it makes development a lot easier, because it gives us all the magic of OpenStack. And by that I mean we have the Garrett review system, Jenkins for testing, and we actually have tests there out now that will actually execute and on any changes that you uh, submit. Better yet, documentation. Documentation is a lot more clearer now. We have an IRC channel as well, and you can actually submit bugs and feature requests too. But the real key thing I wanna say in this slide is we're very much looking for help and any contributions or even operators. So if someone wants to try it out, reach, it, reach out to us on IRC. There's some emails you can use there as well. I think that's it. Aaron, do you wanna take over for the vision slides? Thank you very much, Andy. No problem. Good. All right, so here's my vision for Stolet. So <coughs> clearly we're currently focused on um, integrating into Swift using Docker and running Stolets in Java. But there is no reason why we couldn't um, add more languages there. I think that Scala is in particular um, interesting because many Spark developers, Spark has a nice feature called user-defined functions that can run over uh, the Spark data during analysis. Um, and I think they're mostly using Scala. So if we could write storlets in Scala and push them down automatically, that could be like a huge ecosystem thing. Um, Next, I mean, why just use Docker? Why not, you know, go zero VM, KVM, or even integrate with OpenStack Nova and get whatever OpenStack Nova works with, right? Um, and I should also mention Magnum in this case. Um, and then perhaps more futuristic is to look at other storage systems such as the CF object gateway or databases that have um, blobs attached to them. So this is the vision, and I'll end up with this thought here. And before ending, I just want to really, really thank Doron Han from our team in Haifa, who did the tremendous work of making this an OpenStack project. All the integrations with Jenkins and Garrett, it's not trivial. And then Gil Vernick and Yosef Mwati working very hard on the <coughs> push down, uh, on the Spark push down of Storlets to Swift. And that's it, thank you very much, and we'll be very happy to answer us Oh, before the questions. Yes. A couple quick things. <laughs> Paul, go for it. Oh yeah, so on the Intel side, if, if anybody here is participating in the marketing thing called the Intel Passport Program, um, please see Mahati, maybe you could stand up, raise your hand. Please see her and she'll take care of you and make sure you get stamped or whatever they're doing. Thanks. And uh, really quickly from IBM, and again, I'm forced to say this, but we're actually hiring. So if anyone's interested at all, 
feel free to contact me and I'm gonna leave it at that. So thank you all so much. Thanks. So any questions? Actually, sorry, yes. <laughs> So, uh, thanks. So, sorry, I think that's actually just recording. Oh, okay. No, 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 yeah, oh, yeah. Okay. I'll just leave it. I apologize. Yeah. That's my fault. No. Uh, so, thank you for a good yeah. presentation. So, uh, just, uh, I, my question is for uh, the developer side. But, uh, uh, so, how is working for the uh, learning Docker container uh, on the copy case? So, uh, how many uh, explain the uh, the Docker in case on put and the get, and uh, sometimes we want uh, uh, to make a new object from the uh, or, uh, original raw data into the uh, some temporary uh, metadata case. Yeah, so absolutely good point. So in Paris, we actually gave, we had a post verb, which is, um, which I would say is not the right verb to do that. Copy is the right verb to do that, and this is on top of my feature list. We actually have use case in IBM that that needs that. So I'm going. Uh, anybody who wishes to work on that is very welcome. But in, in other words, that was a really good question. So and uh, we thought about that. Sounds good. Thank you. Anybody else? Thanks, Coda. Um, so my question is about uh, resource isolation. Um, so for example, if a user executes something that takes a long time, what happens in case, for example, for timeouts? Yep. What about um, if the load on one of the storage nodes gets too high? Because sometimes, for example, after rebalance, you have to shuffle a lot of data to another node, and that might interact uh, with the loads that you um, see from the Docker containers. Do you work on that, or? <coughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, well, yes. We, sure. now know why <laughs> Paul, we now know why Paul is very supportive of <laughs> the <right>. feature, yeah. <laughs> so, <coughs> So basically, um, this is something that is not yet implemented, but we're, but we're trusting that um, Docker would have the tunable. It has some tunables. They're not as rich as what other container um, technologies gives you or what C groups gives you. But at the end of the day, we're going to have to add the man those tunables as, as managed by the operator. So at the end of the day, the user can control the Docker image, but the operator would control the tunables of the isolation. Does it answer the question, or I missed something? Yes, basically, what about if you want to um, isolate different accounts and give different accounts a different level of resources that they can use? Right, so yeah, 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 yeah. so, so th this falls into the same category. Okay, it's something right, that okay. we haven't done yet, again, help is mostly yeah, sure, sure. <laughs> so just, just to quickly add, though, that's a really good point. And the way it works today is you definitely need that storelet to respond within a certain period of time. Otherwise, you hit timeouts on the proxy or object exactly. server side. Yeah. So it's actually a really excellent point. Yeah. We do clearly document that, though, in the code for now. But right. it's something we're actually looking to. In terms of resources, another really good question, actually, because it's very important you have spare CPU resources. So just a, an interesting point is if you're using something like Spark, Spark actually ends up hammering the Swift object server with hundreds of range gets literally hundreds, even for a simple job. And the key is, the way storelets work, I didn't actually mention it in detail, but for example, if you have a single storelet, what we'll do is we'll create a thread pool, and we'll actually run these all concurrently. But the important part about that there is you need the CPU cycles to accomplish that. Sure. So it's, it's a very good point. And, and an interesting part about that is it, it's another trade-off to whether do you run storelets on the proxy side, on the object side, and it all comes down to if you have spare capacity. Okay, thank you very much. All right, thank you. In the uh, proxy pipeline, yeah, obviously you insert the, yep. the middleware. Um, do I, because storelets run one per account, do I have to, the, the actual middleware, can it handle multiple accounts and multiple storelets, or do I have to insert it for every account, every no, storelet? No, absolutely. It can handle actually multiple accounts. Okay. So you only need to insert that on your one, what, for example, proxy pipeline. And there's actually a lot of configuration you can do that will actually determine the details in terms of what permissions are for which accounts. Which accounts can even run storelets as well. So, And can a single account use multiple storelets as well? Yes. Oh, a absolutely. So a single account can upload hundreds of storelets. And all of them will execute in that single container for that account. Mm -hmm. So, And obviously, though, it's multi-threaded. So we have different threads for, for each one of these. So, Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you all so much. That was really great. Thank you.